Hi, I'm Holly Lynn Lee. I'm from North Carolina State University. Um, I'm a faculty member, a professor in the STEM education department in our College of Education, and I'm a senior faculty fellow at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation. Um, all the different resources that I will be sharing with you today are linked in my presentation, and that PDF for the presentation will be shared on the Math Summit website, so you can check out to make sure you can get access to all the um, resources. So today I'm going to be talking with you about investigating the real world and how we can get middle school students experiences in data science. The theme that my presentation falls under is theme number six for the conference, um, leveraging STEAM applications for in-demand careers in the middle grades, grades four through eight. And the careers, the in-demand careers that we're going to be focusing on today are that of a data scientist, a data visualization specialist, and a data journalist. So the work that I do here at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation is part of HiRISE, a hub for innovation and research in statistics education. Um, I'm the director of HiRISE, and my collaborator, Jima Majika, is the co-director. And within HiRISE, we have lots of different um, federally funded projects that uh, we're going to be drawing upon today. Um, so I, I have my acknowledgments here to the four different um, grant numbers that uh, our project is um, drawing, the work that I'll be uh, sharing today is drawing upon. So in 2018-19, I had an opportunity to do an ethnographic study to really try to understand the work of data scientists. Um, in that ethnographic study, I was actually immersed in the workplace with data scientists for about nine months. Um, and I got a chance to observe them, to go to their group meetings, their different presentations that they made, both internal to the organization as well as external, um, and having lots of different informal conversations with them. Uh, accompanied with that, I did interviews with five data scientists. They were not all from that particular um, um, organization. Um, as well as I collected interviews that had been posted publicly on the website. And my goal was to really understand what does it feel like to be a data scientist? What do they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, and how could we learn from that to actually help um, frame the future of middle school and high school experiences with students to, um, to think about the career of a data scientist? So some of the things that I learned was that data scientists spend a lot of time thinking about the role of the context or the purpose of the problem that they're trying to solve. So they have clients that come to them and um, try to help them make sense of whatever data or problem that they have. And the data scientists actually spend a lot of time trying to understand that context and thinking about the purposes of what their client is hiring them to do. Um, that also comes into, the pl into play at the end when they're really trying to figure out how to communicate their findings um, so that there's actually actionable items that the company or the organization that hired them, uh, their client can actually take. And throughout their entire work, they are uh, really working in a lot of flexible different ways. They have a healthy uh, amount of skepticism. They work in teams. Data science is not an isolated process. There may be times when you're working by yourself, but a lot of the things that you're doing is um, integrating uh, with the work that other people are doing on your team. They're constantly seeking out expertise when they run up against something, whether it's a technical issue or whether it's something about the context um, um, that they need to better understand. They're, they're immersed in data constantly. Uh, they spend a lot of hours trying to make sense of data, trying to process that data, trying to organize it so that they can actually analyze it and build models. Um, they're persistent. They're resilient. They told stories of how much they had to actually um, revisit a lot of the, the problems that they sometimes had to um, had to work on, um, throw out things that they had worked on for a while that didn't work and persist through that. They learn how to communicate. They learn how to create visualizations. Oftentimes on data science teams, they actually have dedicated data visualists. So that's a, that's a particular career path that someone within data science um, can pursue. Uh, they're, the, they're the ones in charge of making um, the final data visualizations that might be used on dashboards or in reports um, or in papers. And data scientists have a really broad toolkit. They know how to use a lot of different tools and they go back and forth to using and integrating these tools whenever they um, are solving different problems. So a lot of this um, I used along with my, with my colleagues 
to try to think about, well, how does that match what we've been, what we have been doing for the past 20 years or so in K-12 education about engaging students in a statistical investigation? And these, um, these different phases of a statistical investigation, the diagrams that I have shown here might look familiar to you. You may have seen something very similar to it in some of your curriculum materials. But you'll notice that some of the things that I was talking about, um, like spending so much time immersed in processing data, doesn't naturally kind of show up in these simple four phase um, cycles. So what my colleagues and I did was we, we proposed what we call a data investigation process. Um, that has six phases. And we tried to surface some of the processes that data scientists actually use um, so that they become more obvious and integrated into the experience of students. So this six phase process that we have here is much more holistic. It's non-linear. So we, we used puzzle pieces to kind of communicate um, the emphasis that um, you really go back and forth and that you might be exploring and visualizing data, for example, and you come across a question um, about a particular measure and you have to go back to the phase of considering the data to really understand how a, a particular attribute maybe was measured so that you um, build models that are appropriate for that particular measurement. And that might take you the whole way back to framing your problem and really understanding your context a little bit better. So there's a lot of back and forth um, in this that is much more reflective of the practices in the real world than perhaps a linear cycle um, might indicate. So um, what we do in some of our work is that we take this framework and we actually break it down into some sub pieces so that um, the students and teachers can um, get a sense of what's actually involved in each of these different phases. And what's showing here on the screen is a particular poster that we put together, a handout um, that teachers and students can use to kind of refer to um, when they are doing data investigations. Um, down at the bottom, you'll notice that some of those key considerations and dispositions are there. For example, you have to make sense of data with respect to the context, always keeping that the context of the data, the phenomena that you're studying um, in the forefront of your mind, taking advantage of technology tools so that you um, are flexible in that. Down at the end, being able to consider ethical issues and biases that might be in your data. That's something that, that came across a lot with data scientists and, and what they are um, uh, really trying to think about when they're working with data and being a skeptic, um, having a healthy amount of skepticism that can help one um, approach data in a healthy way, not just believe everything that you that you perhaps see um, in data. So the three resources that I have here, when you look at the um, PowerPoint, um, the PDF of, of this presentation, um, these links will take you to resources that can help you further understand the data investigation process. So for over a decade, um, myself and my colleagues here at NC State have en been engaging middle grade learners with bigger data. And I put bigger in this um, you know, funny parentheses here because big data, when we think about the big data that data scientists and industry work with, it's huge. It's terabytes of data. Middle grade learners are not working with terabytes of data, but they are working with data that is bigger than what they have traditionally been exposed to. So this data has multiple variables in it. It's multivariate. It has different types of attributes or variables in it so that there are some categorical variables. There are some quantitative or numerical variables in it. The data might be a little messy. Um, there might be some erroneous um, data in there. There might be some missing data in there. And there's many cases. So not only are there many variables, but there are many cases. And in the work that we do with middle grade students, we like to use tools that really promote visualization and analysis um, that, that allow them to link different representations together and facilitate data moves and simple coding that they can do um, to help process data. And so data moves are things like um, taking, a, taking data, and you can see, for example, these two girls in the upper, um, upper picture, um, have uh, cases um, that are displayed in the scatter plot and they're they're colored two different colors by taking an attribute and recoloring those icons that is a data move that's something that can help them actually reimagine and read something different in the data because now we have added color 
And all throughout all these experiences with middle grade learners, we are engaging them with real context. The purpose of working with data is not to learn about certain, certain graphs. It's not to learn about different statistical measures, but to use graphs and to use statistical measures to help make sense of whatever real problem or real context that the students are actually trying to learn about. So we're gonna go through some of that today. Um, one of the best quotes that I got from my research um, study was from a data scientist who was a former math teacher. And he said to me, you know, a lot of education right now is kind of catering towards standardized testing. And I'm sure that a lot of us can relate to that. Um, and he said, you know, standardized testing is pretty much the exact opposite of doing what I described and what you're going to have to do in the real world. So he was proposing that we do more open-ended project type approaches, um, project type assignments that encourage students to kind of find their own way and come up with their own solutions. Um, and so I think it, it, it really spoke to me to be able to hear from a data scientist about that. So we're gonna go into our first example. Um, and in this example, we're gonna try to understand something about the roller coaster industry in the US. And the career connections that we're making are to that of a data scientist and a data visualist. So take a look at these three pictures of roller coasters that I have here and think about what do you notice about these coasters? So one might notice that they are different colors. One is green, one is a light blue, one is white, and it looks like it may have been made out of wood where the other ones are made out of steel. The other two are made out of steel. So those are some things we might have noticed. I might notice that one has a pretty extreme drop on it. Um, I might notice that the green one actually is turning the riders upside down into a loop. All right. So then what are some things that I might wonder based on these pictures? I might wonder, you know, at what point did we like stop using wood and start moving towards using steel? You know, is wood steel, is wood still a, um, a viable uh, uh, material that is used in the engineering of roller coasters? And if so, how, do, how does that might maybe constrain the different features that a roller coaster might have? For example, can I do such an extreme drop or can I get turned upside down if the Roller coasters are made out of wood. And so now I'm into kind of thinking about some of the engineering about roller coasters and um, how that might come into play as to different characteristics of them. So a lot of times when we're working with students, it's, it's, it's good to kind of launch these activities, getting them engaged and thinking about the context of the data, trying to frame the problem for them. So uh, in 2022, in September, Cedar Point, which is a large amusement park in Ohio, um, announced that they were retiring um, a roller coaster called the Top Thrill Dragster. And this is actually a picture of the Top Thrill Dragster here. And so uh, something to um, have the students kind of think about this is that they need to consider and gather data themselves. So what can we find out about the Top Thrill Dragster? So kids immediately get on and, and ask Dr. Google, all right, what, what about uh, the, the Top Thrill Dragster can we find out? Can we find out where it is? What year did it open? How fast can it go? Um, what, what's the ride duration of it? What kind of material is it made of? So the students go out and they find um, the different information about the Top Thrill Dragster. And um, they're able to actually um, uh, record on this data card the different values for the different attributes um, for this roller coaster. And this data card, we can think about it like an index card. Um, and so if I, if my students were actually investigating several different and finding data about several different roller coasters. I can think about that as a stack of index cards where on each card, I have some information about that roller coaster. And then from that, we can start asking some investigative questions. What might we want to know about roller coasters? And I have a sample of two different questions that, that students might um, come up with. Um, how do different characteristics of roller coasters create different rider experiences? Um, and then how have the characteristics or the features of roller coasters changed over time? Those might be two questions that students are, in, are interested in. One of the tools that I use a lot in my um, research is called CODAP. 
And CodeUp is free. There's no login required. It's very easy to use. And several of my research projects have partnered with um, the Concord Consortium in the development of CodeUp so that we are actually able to co-design some of the features in this software. So we're going to take a look um, very quickly at some things that you can do in CodeUp um, related to a data set of roller coasters. So roller coasters um, in May 2020, we um, did some web scraping to get a, a data set of 635 roller coasters that were actually in operation in the U.S. at that point. Um, these coasters are grouped into four regions of the country, and I have them color coded on the map there. Um, so we have the south in purple, west in orange, northeast in um, green, and the Midwest in that teal color. And by adding geography into um, a data set, it actually um, helps students to kind of think about place and um, they might have bit better connections to it. And so since I'm located in North Carolina, um, I may be wanting to start my investigation of looking at the roller coasters that are actually in the South. And so that's what we're going to actually start with today, where I've got the entire 635 um, set of roller coasters. I have them grouped into to the um, four regions, and then I filtered it so that I'm only going to start by looking at those that are in the South. So here is CODAP. Um, and in this data set, um, in this document, in this CODAP document, I have the roller coasters and we can see that I have it arranged right now um, like a data card. So I'm looking at the roller coaster called Rampage right now and it's located in Alabama. Um, and I can click my arrow here and go through and take a look at, imagine kind of flipping over your index cards. And so here's one way to view the roller coasters, but I can also switch and look at it as a table where each of my cases, each of my index cards is a row, and then each of the variables or the attributes are my columns. All right. And so now I have um, 223 cases of the different roller coasters in the South. So looking at that, I might be very interested in the maximum height. So I'm going to pick one variable, and this is a drag and drop environment, so it makes it very intuitive and easy. Um, I, I'm telling you, the middle school kids pick up on how easy it is to do this very, very quickly. Um, and so I'm able to drag this out and take a look at what the max height might be. And I could add in um, a box plot and take a look and see, oh, are there any outliers in here? And indeed there are. And I might be very interested to know that this coaster in the South that is has the highest maximum height is actually in North Carolina, the Fury 325. And there's actually some interesting news um, currently going on about that roller coaster. Um, and um, I'm able to actually see that it's at the Park Carowinds. Um, so thinking about this maximum height, I might wonder, going back to my example of wood and steel, if whether the roller coaster is made of wood or steel might make a difference in the height. So I'm going to bring down the type and I can see that um, actually of the roller coasters in the south, the wooden roller coasters actually have a higher median than the steel ones do. And I can think about the variability, all right? So I have this huge spread um, with my coasters that are made of steel um, in their maximum height, all right? So there are some, there's, there's a lot of coasters that um, actually are not very tall at all, all right? And so that's certainly affecting the median um, for, um, for this. And I can come back up here and I'm going to actually add back in some of my hidden attributes. So I'm going to add more columns, more variables to this, and I'm going to overlay scale. And I can see that actually a lot of the coasters that are not very tall are either a family ride or a kiddie ride. 
All right. And that makes sense to, that my kitty rides are not going to be very tall. And it makes sense that my family rides. And so it could be that in my comparison that I don't want to include family and kitty rides. So I'm going to select all of those and I'm going to filter this yet once again. So I am going to hide my unselected cases. No, actually, I'm going to hide my selected cases. Excuse me. So I'm going to hide the family and the kitty rides so that I'm left with only those that are considered extreme and thrill. And I can see now that the median is actually a little bit larger for the steel. And I could add in the means if I wanted to also compare the means. All right. I'm still having a large amount of variability in those that are steel though. Um, so the heights, just because it's made of steel does not mean that it's going to be really tall. So we are back in the slideshow here. And um, I just wanted to, to share with you some um, things that has, have happened with students when I've been working with them. So two students that I was working with had um, created a scatter plot of drop on the x-axis and top speed on the y-axis. And they said, it looks like a spaceship, right? That was their impression of what they were seeing. And I said, what does this graph tell you about the coasters? And the students responded, it tells us the top speed and the drop. Right? They could only name the variables. They weren't able to actually think about the relationship between those two variables or the trend um, of the relationship between drop and top speed. So I, I was wondering, like, how could I get them to actually notice this? So I showed them how to recolor the dots by type, which is whether or not it's made of wood or steel. And so when they, when they drug those on, they um the type they became colored as wooden and steel and i said okay so now what do you see and they said oh they noticed the colors and then one of the students says oh a lot of the wooden ones are slower and have a shorter drop so that sentence right there slower and have a shorter drop now the student was able to actually see a relationship between those two variables and so this is a nice example where um, you, may, you make a graph perhaps looking more complex because I added a third variable of type to it. But by adding that third variable and more importantly, the color, I was able to get them to actually focus in on those cases and um, be able to make some statements about a relationship. So I have a complete lesson plan um, linked here for you if you'd like to try um, this activity out in your classroom. Um, and I have a video that you can watch on your own of students um, having some conversations about roller coasters. And this, this was a particular um, seventh grade class. And we're not going to watch the video. Okay. I also have links to two papers that you can um, read um, to... Uh, dig into um, the data investigation process, and particularly the one on the left, the digging into data, um, walks through the roller coaster um, lesson plan example. So our second example, thinking about patterns in extreme weather, and we're going to make career correction um, connections to a data visualist and data journalist. So we see in the news lots of different kinds of um, data visualizations, right? So a data journalist, their job is to actually report data in the news. And oftentimes they're going to have some type of accompanying visualization. And many times these visualizations are not the typical ones that our students are learning in textbooks. They're not the ones that show up on standardized testing. But we need to have our students be able to interpret the kinds of representations that they see in the news, that they see on social media, so that they can start being able to be part of the conversations around different issues. This particular um, representation is about the weather stations um, across the U.S. and where the percent of weather stations that actually have broke all time temperature records. And we see that the color is being used, that blue represents a cold record, temperature record, and the orange represents a heat record, right? And so again, we can use this um, idea of what do you notice and what do you wonder? And the way that, that um, we do this is, you know, in a data investigation process, the communicate part, the visualizing and communicate is something that you do while you're investigating data. But if you're reading a news article, 
you're reading somebody else's and you're seeing somebody else's visualization. And so there's some reverse sense making that has to ha has to happen on your part to try to understand this. So we need to be able to think about these two aspects. And so we developed a framework to help um, teachers have conversations uh, uh, with students about unpacking and making sense of a data visualization. And we do this by paying attention to three different areas, unpacking the context and history, reading the visualization and personalizing the data. So I'm not gonna have time to actually go into a lot of these different um, questions, but for this particular example, unpacking the context and history is really trying to think about like, what do we know about this context about weather stations? What do we know about the fact that weather stations are, are keeping track of um, temperatures and temperature extremes? Who created this visualization and why did they actually create this? Can we kind of maybe go back to the original article and try to think about that? Um, the fourth bullet, what are contextual or historical reasons for the patterns that we're actually seeing in this graph? Um, so understanding the context and the history is a part of trying to unpack this. We also just need to make sense of some of the very basic things of like what was being observed and measured at these weather stations? What, what, what is being actually reported here? Yeah. And um, for example, the, the, um, the specific measurements that are shown in the US map down below, we have a little legend over here that tells us that the size of the circle is indicating by how many degrees the record was broken. So our smaller dots represent a record being broken by only one degree, whereas the larger circles represent a record that was broken by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? And so by knowing the, uh, the emphasis on the size of the circles, one can start thinking about um, what, where are we seeing small records, records being broken by a small amount and records being broken by a large amount. Right? Personalizing the data is a really important part of this process. You know, how do you relate to this, right? If I'm, if I'm doing this investigation in North Carolina, a student might say, well, you know, there were no records broken in North Carolina. So, you know, I might not care as much, but, you know, I have, I have a grandmother that lives um, on the West Coast, you know, out in Oregon, out in Washington. And, you know, they were telling me about all of these different weather um weather events that were happening in 2021 in the summer and the heat that was just extreme. And so that makes sense to me. Right? So, you know, it might make somebody feel a certain way because they have a personal connection to it. And it allows that space for students to have this personal connection to what's going on and it can help them in their interpretations and their storytelling. Um, and then being able to think about communicating and proposing actions. So getting students to think about, well, if you were going to write an article using this visualization, what would you make the headline to be? You know, um, and what, what would you do, maybe change about this visualization to make it more useful for others or for yourself? Right. So there's different kinds of things that um, one can think about as far as communication and then proposing actions based on what you're seeing here. Are you propelled to, to, to take any actions or maybe refrain from taking certain actions that um, to perhaps prevent some of these extreme um, weather changes happening? So one of the projects that I um, work on, the Writing Data Stories, um, it has shared all of their different uh, materials. And again, um, by looking at the PDF of this presentation, you can go in, um, and get access to all of these. Um, one of them is a, data, a resource called Data Story Bytes, where we use different um, graphs. And we, we actually, it's a series of Google Slides that students can actually work through so that um, we're posing some of those questions to help them really make sense of the visualization um, and idea, ways of personalizing it, ways of understanding that context, ways of actually trying to make sure that they're reading the visualization correctly. And then we have a two page article that really kind of discusses that process. Other resources, we have a handout that can help um, both students and teachers um, think about the kind of ways to discuss um, uh, visualizations and make sense of these using that framework that I just discussed. 
Um, and then a great source and an inspiration for all of these activities comes from the what's going on in this graph from the New York Times Learning Network. And so there is a large collection of data visualizations there that you can use in your class. So the last thing I want to spend my last minute or two just telling you about the support that we have for teachers professional learning. Um, in March, we launched um, a new platform called InStep with Data. And in InStep, this is a free place that teachers can go. Um, teachers um, in grades 6 through 12, we have math teachers in there, science teachers, social studies teachers. Those are our primary um, audiences. And um, they come in and they're, they're, they want to learn more about how to teach statistics and how to teach data science topics. And we organize our learning um, for teachers around from research what we know about the different dimensions for having an effective learning environment for statistics and data science. And so these seven dimensions um, actually allow us to um, or, um, create different modules so the teachers can become more proficient in understanding, for example, data and statistical practices. We're becoming more comfortable on how to design good tasks or how to promote argumentation and discourse um, in their classroom. Or for example, how to use different technology tools. So there's two primary pathways that one can use in InStep. They can actually engage in data investigations themselves. And you can see here that um, one of our investigations is on the US roller coasters. And so as a learner, we want teachers to jump in and investigate data themselves and learn how to use CodeApp um, to, to uh, investigate the different data. Um, or they can, and they can, um, choose a self-paced module in any one of these different dimensions. So all of the resources are organized in the modules um, that teachers can choose to do. And we have a dashboard that allows them to keep track of what they're doing so that they can pick up and resume where they are. Every resource has a time on it so that we, so that we know teachers are really busy and they can choose to come in and if they only have 30 minutes, they can go and look at a resource um, and engage with it um, in that time frame. Um, check off that they've completed it. And then when they come back, um, they come back in in a week, come back in two weeks, they can resume where they left off and then um, pick up with learning in that module or that data investigation. There's a lot of other things in there and it is completely free. So I hope that you would take the time to um, go and investigate it. It's instepwithdata.org. Um, my team at the Friday Institute at High Rise, um, we have a lot of different resources on our website as well. You're also welcome to email me and connect with me. I would love to um, find out what you're doing um, and the ways that we might be able to partner um, going forward. And I do have, um, if you're interested in looking at some of the resource, uh, research that actually supports the examples that I provided today, I have this reference list for you as well. So um, again, thank you for joining me. And I think we're going to go now into the Q&A um, session where um, we can engage with one another. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I'd love to know if um, anyone that's here has actually used CODAP before. Uh, let's see, I've got a question here from Michael. Um, if there was one skill you would most recommend teachers mastering related to data science, what would that be? All right, so for a skill for a teacher, um, honestly, I think it is um, being able to engage in exploratory data analysis. So um, being comfortable enough to play with the data um, and that you... Um, um, that you become comfortable in letting your, your letting your teacher, your students, excuse me, actually, um, um, your, your students actually drive kind of the conversation in the classroom. So I, I think, um, being able to, uh, so that may not be directly what you're asking. Um, but I, I think that it's a, um, it's, it's a good pedagogical skill, um, to be able to engage with. Um, but yeah, CodeApp is incredibly easy to learn. Again, if you download the PDF, um, I have a link to CodeApp's website. If you did a Google for CodeApp, you would totally find it. Um, the, the next question about materials for pre-service teachers, absolutely. Actually, one of my grants that I um, did not directly talk about in this presentation, but that one of the videos actually comes from is a project called Esteem. 
E S T E E M. And um, with the, so what I've learned is that I can't actually type in the chat. So, um, but um, if you Google my name and the phrase esteem, you will find our materials. We actually have a set of materials to, um, um, that, that are built in a learning management system that university faculty can actually um, um, export and import into their LMS to use directly with their college students. Um, and we have CODAP integrated into all of those activities. And that's to help teachers, not only um, pre-service teachers learn about how to do data investigations, but also how to teach them in different critical kind of um, lenses that they have to take. Let me see the next question. How can I incorporate this into a, into Steam games? Um, so Hector, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, actually, at the CODAP website, um, there was a project called Data Games where they, um, they were having different games plugged into CODAP and data that was collected during the game was being exported from the game into CODAP where the students could then analyze data and then that could then go back and inform their gameplay. Um, so that, that, that's one way um, that, that data analysis can actually be incorporated into games. But I suspect that there's people actually thinking about how to integrate it a little um, um, better as well. Let's see. Uh, Colleen just says, thank you. Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, Michael, I've not used CODAP, but would love to learn. It is so easy to pick up on. And um, the, uh, the website, CODAP's website has some great help tutorials. Um, and uh, Michael, you were the one that also asked about the pre-service teachers. Our esteem materials, we actually created some videos, um, some help videos as well. Um, so even if you go onto YouTube and look for CODAP tutorials, you'll start, you'll start seeing some tutorial videos. Holly Lynn at ncsu.edu is how you can reach out to me. I um, would love to get connected with you, um, whether it's about a research project, whether it's about working with your students, um, questions that you might have, resources that you want to um, worry, um, think about. But again, my the PDF um, that's in the resource library on the um, IES platform, as well as it's, at, it's linked at the bottom of the page for this particular presentation, has all those links that I talked about.